podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on free trade agreements and how they can benefit your community. My name is Jessica Ritchie. I'm from the Regional Programs and Engagement Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology, and I'll be moderating today's question and answer period, as well as providing technical support throughout the webinar. I'm located in Victoria, British Columbia, on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. Uh, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes introducing the webinar platform to you in case you haven't used it before, and then I'll introduce our speakers and we'll move right into the content for today's webinar. So, if you haven't used GoToWebinar before, there's a couple of things that you'll benefit from knowing. If you have any questions, you'll see that there is a question panel on the question box on the control panel. You'll have to open it up by just hitting that triangle. And please do ask any questions that you have for our presenters throughout the presentation. We'll be having a question and answer period at the end of the session, but um, don't wait till the end of the session because you might forget. So pop them in there and I'll have lots of questions to ask our panelists at the end of the session. If you are having any challenges with the audio, you can also use your phone to call in if you're having uh, connection issues. Just click on the phone call button and a phone number will pop up with a pin and you'll be able to access um, the audio that way. The other thing that you can do is you can raise your hand. Raising your hand just lets me know you have a question or concern and I can reach out to you directly. Uh, a quick reminder, today's session is going to be recorded. So uh, if you know anyone who would benefit from the information that's being shared today, or if you want to go back and review what you've seen, you'll be able to find it on the Economic Development website. You can look under the BC Ideas Exchange past webinar section, and you'll be able to see all the information there. So that's all of the administrative stuff out of the way. I'm going to hand this over to my colleagues at the International Trade Division of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology. We're joined with Ben Kaliznik. Chelsea Lusani and Hevid Sami. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. I'm just uh, starting my webcam here. So my name is Ben Kaliznik, as Jessica said, and I work in the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch in the BC Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology. Uh, Chelsea, Havind, and I are going to be sharing the presenting duties today, so we'll sort of go back and forth between us. Uh, the branch that Chelsea and I work for um, uh, represents BC's interest in free trade agreement negotiations, uh, trade disputes affecting BC, and we also work to increase businesses' awareness of the opportunities of, that can be found in free trade agreements. So thanks for being here today and uh, to, to come and hear about how trade agreements can benefit your community. If uh, I'm speaking too fast or you're having trouble hearing us, please just uh, send a note to Jessica and I'm sure she'll let us know. Today we plan to cover quite a bit. Uh, we're going to go quickly over what uh, our ministry is all about and what free trade agreements do, uh, as well as Canada's free trade agreement landscape. And then we're going to go into the opportunities that uh, most free trade agreements have in common for the goods sectors, um, the services sectors, uh, investment, and for government procurement in particular. Uh, we also hope to walk you through some practical tools, um, things like Canada's Tariff Finder, uh, and then I think Kevin will talk later about uh, some other provincial resources that are available. Uh, some of this is a little bit dense and technical, and um, the good thing is that there are time for questions, but um, I, hopefully the one thing, if you can take away one thing, it's that you know that you can contact us after this uh, webinar is over. And, um, you know, we're, we're always here to answer any questions or address any concerns. And um, if we can't, then we definitely know uh, who to put you in touch with, um, whether that's the federal government or wh whoever it might be. So uh, I think we're going to start with uh, our first uh, poll question. And... Um, Jessica just put that up on the screen there. And the question is, what percentage of BC goods exports go to the U.S.? That's great. I can see a lot of people have responded, so I'm just going to close the poll and I'll show the results.
Okay. So, uh, looks like 72% uh, uh, was clearly the favorite. And uh, the correct answer is? Forty nine percent. Sorry, I thought we were gonna show that up on the screen. <laughs> okay. So so the correct answer is forty nine percent. So moving into uh, the ministry, um, we're really aiming to make life more affordable for British Columbians by building a strong, sustainable, innovative economy that works for everyone. Uh, there are many ways to foster this economic growth. One just one of those is to encourage businesses to leverage the opportunities that can be found in free trade agreements. Uh, through those agreements, BC goods and services can become more competitive. Uh, we can revitalize traditional industries and establish new ones. Uh, we can uh, foster trade diversification, which is, is, you know, is very important in uh, today's trade climate. Um, and we can also create jobs. The problem is free trade agreements are very long and complex and technical. And it's unreasonable to expect that most uh, small and medium-sized enterprises would have the resources and the time to really navigate uh, the web of FTAs, let alone the complex details of just one of those free trade agreements. You know, big businesses might have those tools, but small and medium-sized businesses are really sort of busy creating jobs uh, and growing their businesses. And so through our FTA outreach and education initiative, our goal is to really focus on uh, underrepresented export groups and SMEs to ensure that the economic benefits of uh, those free trade agreements are widespread and understood throughout the province. Uh, and now I think we're going to have another poll question. So which of these is normally covered in a free trade agreement? All right, great. Uh, it looks like uh, everyone got the right answer on that one. That's, that's terrific. So um, uh, you probably heard um, me mention some of these before, but uh, definitely Chelsea is going to go into to some more details later to, uh, to let you know how they are, are in all of those agreements. So uh, moving on to uh, what free trade agreements actually do. The first thing that they do is build on WTO CO access. I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of the World Trade Organization. This is the foundation of global trade. It really sets the rules of trade between nations. There are 164 member countries. Uh, through the WTO, members set their base tariff rates. Those are duties um, on the products that come into their country. And uh, they, so they set those with all other countries. Um, but they also sign on to other aspects of trade, um, rules around other aspects of trade, like uh, government pure procurement, for example. Uh, the other thing that members do through the WTO is settle uh, trade disputes. And FTAs build on the commitments made at the WTO. Um, and one way they do that is by uh, members sort of offer uh, better or preferential treatment, um, especially on tariff rates, uh, to a bilateral free trade agreement partner. So that goes beyond the WTO access that they've provided. Um, free trade agreements typically cover goods, services, investment, government procurement, uh, intellectual property, environment, labor, and inclusive trade. And some of these um, are a little more common in more modern uh, FTAs. Um, it's, uh, you know, Canada, some of Canada's earlier free trade agreements were not as ambitious as some of the ones that are being negotiated now. Um, they were really only sort of focused on goods. And so now as we, as we have um, modernized the, the free trade agreement process, they have come to include things like uh, in, uh, inclusive trade. Um, inclusive trade in particular is really trying to ensure that the benefits of free trade agreements are felt by, um, widely felt. So by women, by SMEs, by indigenous people. 
and that is um, fairly new. Uh, it is uh, something that was worked into the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP. Uh, it is also something that is found in the renegotiated uh, Kuzma. Um, but uh, the point is, uh, as we've gone on, they have sort of become more, uh, the, the net has been thrown wider and include more aspects of, of daily business activities. And so they're getting more and more complex. Uh, but what, what do free trade agreements really do? What do they, how do they make trade easier and, and how do they facilitate that business and in some cases reduce the, the cost of doing business? The first is tariff reduction. This is sort of the most tangible aspect of free trade agreements. Um, you know, they reduce the cost of and make uh, BC products more competitive. Uh, if someone told you that your uh, blueberries could be 15% cheaper uh, going into Vietnam to the CPTPP, um, and, and also 15% cheaper than competitors that don't have that preferential access, uh, that's a pretty compelling, um, that's, that's compelling. Um, tariff reductions also reduce the cost of imports into Canada. And so we talk a lot about exports and that's, that's great. But you know, bringing something in, uh, such as shrimp from Vietnam, uh, and then putting that into a, a, a processed food product for, for re-export, um, that, that can also save you money by reducing those tariffs. As for non-tariff barriers, these are the uh, technical requirements and differing standards and, and certification procedures, labeling requirements, all those sort of uh, things related to human and animal and plant health. Um, these are, uh, of course, these are important, but if you're being told that you need to do the same certification procedures or you're duplicating things and, and it's, you know, it's adding to your costs, that can be very frustrating, of course. And so the good thing is most FTAs contain committees designed to identify these and address these and uh, hopefully reduce that duplication. The next is rules of origin. These are uh, these can be very complicated and are sometimes product specific. FTAs spell the ways out in which you can source a product from FTA partners uh, and still gain preferential treatment for that good. So if that good is coming from Canada and it's a raw material and it's you know it's clearly demonstrated that it's from Canada, that's probably not going to be a problem. But if it is a manufactured good or something that has parts and pieces from, from other countries as well, um, outside of the FDA partners, then some, sometimes you need to make that calculation to figure out whether it makes, um, makes the, the cut as far as uh, getting that preferential tariff or preferential treatment. So FDA try to be as clear as possible in how that is done and how that is calculated. Um, the reality is some of them are better than others at doing that. Uh, the good thing is, you if you're if you're unsure if a business is unsure, um, you can apply through the Canada Border Services Agency for an advanced ruling, um, or you may be able to apply for something similar through the export country. It just depends on the agreement in question. Uh, the next is facilitated business entry. This really makes it easier for a business person to enter FDA markets, uh, whether they're an investor. Um, an intra-corporate transfer, and, um, and you, so a business may also find them useful for um, bringing them in. They are reciprocal provisions, so you may need someone uh, that has a uh, you know, technical expertise in um, fixing some machinery that you've imported from Europe, for example, that you just cannot find in Canada, and so that may, an agreement may allow you to bring someone in to do that more easily. Uh, government procurement. As you all know well, uh, governments buy goods and services a lot, and uh, our FTAs aim to ensure that that process is transparent and impartial and accountable and accessible by all. And again, some FTAs uh, are a little better than others at doing this, but um, the CPTPP in particular really aims to uh, speak to SMEs and uh, try to make it as clear as possible for small and medium-sized businesses. To, to access some of those, uh, some of those uh, opportunities. The most important thing you need to know is that the access to government procurement markets varies by country and by agreement and must be above set thresholds. 
Uh, finally, transparency and predictability and recourse for disputes. Uh, FTAs, the idea is really that uh, we have agreed upon rules with our free trade agreement partners and we have dispute resolution to enforce those. So uh, it, that really gives it the teeth and we know that we can hold our, our free trade agreement partners accountable to the, uh, to the things that they signed up for. So here we have uh, a map showing Canada's free trade agreement uh, network. And as you probably know, Canada and BC have historic, historically sent a majority of our goods and services to the United States. And this makes a lot of sense. Uh, BC produces a lot of things that uh, the US wants. Uh, NAFTA has provided preferential access to that US market for decades now. And they're right next door. It's a lot easier in some cases to transport our goods in, to, to the United States than it is to other countries. And while the US remains our largest trading partner, uh, over the last decade or so, BC has started to reduce its reliance on the US market and we are trading more now with Asia and other markets. If businesses are looking to diversify, the good news is that Canada has been very busy on the free trade agreement front and that preferential access for Canadian goods and services is growing. So we have talked about NASA and its renegotiated um, Canada-US-Mexico agreement, which as you probably know is signed but not yet ratified, whether it's that or CETA or CCFDA, we now have 14 free trade agreements covering 51 countries. And as you can see from the map, BC is uniquely positioned geographically to take advantage of that network. The other piece of good news is that these free trade agreements do not cancel each other out. So Canada has a free trade agreement with Mexico through NAFTA, and we also have one with Mexico through the CPTPP. And businesses can pick and choose which aspects of those agreements they want to utilize. Now, you might be wondering about the role of the provincial government in free trade agreements. Uh, it's true that the federal government is the one that negotiates and enters into those agreements, uh, but Canada consults stakeholders and the provinces and territories uh, extensively in the lead up to those negotiations and as those negotiations are happening. And that really ensures that those local and regional interests and provincial and, and territorial government interests are all being represented um, as those negotiations are happening. And uh, once those agreements are enforced, provincial governments uh, and sometimes local governments as well are often subject to some of those agreements. And, and you know, government procurement is a perfect example of that. Uh, once those agreements are enforced, a lot of the work that we do in the trade policy negotiation branch is to ensure that provincial policies and regulations are consistent with our trade obligations, because when they aren't, uh, this can result in a dispute, and which can be very costly and time-consuming and um, just um, not, not, very, uh, not a very good experience. Uh, that, all of that said, um, countries and governments don't trade. Businesses trade. And so uh, that is part of the purpose of our outreach and initiative is to try to broadcast some of the opportunities that businesses may not be aware of. Um, of course, it's up to businesses to take that step to, uh, to actually uh, to make those, uh, those trade connections. And now I think we're going to pause for a couple of more polls. So uh, the this question is, which of these countries does Canada have a free trade agreement with? Oh, okay. So very, uh, quite a varied um, response there. And um, the, the answer is actually Israel. So the Canada-Israel agreement has been around for a while, was recently um, re modernized. And, um, and so uh, we 
definitely don't have an agreement with China or Laos at this point. And um, all right. Okay, so here is uh, the next question. Which jurisdictions are in the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, the CFTA? Chelsea's gonna talk about this a little bit later. And uh, this is our one of our domestic trade agreements. Okay, great. I'll just close this last one for you as well. Oh, good. Okay. Well, uh, so the correct answer was all provinces, territories, and the federal government. So well done. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we're going to turn now to some specific trade agreements. So the first one is the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement, CTFCA. Uh, this entered into force on January 1st, 2015. And it was Canada's first FTA in the Asia Pacific. Before that, BC companies um, were at a bit of a disadvantage um, in Korea, in particular because the EU and the US already had deals there. And so um, it, was, it was a big step. And uh, studies have shown that the deal may increase uh, goods exports from BC and Canada to South Korea by as much as 32%. Now, uh, it's been in force for uh, four years or so now. We have seen some evidence of uh, increases in some sectors, forest products and agri-food and seafood. It is waxing and waning, but uh, there does seem to be some, uh, some benefits that are being felt there. BC does have a geographical advantage in accessing Korea, but we also have strong business and, and cultural ties uh, with Korea. And, um, and I think Chelsea will probably give uh, some more examples a little bit later on uh, related to the CCFCA. Turning next to the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, um, you'll find that most of these uh, are quite a mouthful, but uh, that is CETA for short. Uh, the EU is a market of approximately 500 million consumers, and this agreement has been provisionally in force since uh, September 2017. What this means is that most of the agreement, agreement about 95% of it, is in effect. The remaining parts need to be ratified by each EU member state. And this is just because of how the EU divides its uh, jurisdiction on international trade. Uh, the, the CETA is a very ambitious agreement. The tariff elimination on day one was 98%. So as of day one of the agreement, 98% of all tariffs were gone. And once it's fully implemented, uh, up to 99% of tariffs will be will be will be at zero. So that's that's great. Um, Canada is the only G7 country with preferential access to the world's two largest economies. That's the EU and the US. And in fact, we're the only country for now, at least, with preferential access to all of the G7 countries. Uh, as we all know, um, the UK is is uh, also a G7 country and um, but also a member of the EU. Uh, our trade agreement with the UK is through the EU, and so um, uh, if and when the, the UK leaves uh, the EU, um, we would of course no longer have a trade agreement with the UK until Canada negotiates uh, another one with the, the UK. So there's, we all know that there's a lot of uncertainty around Brexit, um, and you may get questions from the businesses that you deal with about that. Uh, you know people who are already uh, exporting to the UK or are maybe interested in doing that. Uh, if there are questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us or connect them with us and we'd be happy to talk to them. Uh, and now I am going to turn it over to Chelsea. Great, thank you, Ben. So the third agreement we'd like to highlight is the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnerships, the CPTPP. Um, many of you may recall that this used to be called the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the United States was a member of this original agreement. Now, as you recall, uh, the U.S. actually withdrew from this agreement last year, and the remaining 11 members of the agreement, and you'll see the second bullet list the current members, 
these people uh, they con they continued with the agreement and kept it in a, and kept going with the agreement after the U.S. withdrew. So this agreement is uh, Canada's most recently implemented trade agreement. It will cover 500 million people when the agreement is fully in effect, and up to 13.5 percent of global GDP. There are also future members, like other countries, that are lining up to join the agreement. Now, at the moment, the agreement is currently in effect for seven out of the 11 members of the CPTPP. So, Canada, Australia, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, and Singapore, as of December 30th, 2018, brought the agreement into effect, and Vietnam brought into effect as of January 14th of this year. Now, the remaining four countries, so Brunei, Chile, Peru, and Malaysia, they are working on ratifying the agreement, and once it comes into effect for everybody, it will be 500 million people. Now, an interesting fact about the CPTPP is that BC is actually expected to benefit more under this agreement than under the original Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the reason for this is that you know, BC companies that sell similar goods and services as American companies, for example, is not competing with American companies in these jurisdictions. So we have a preferential advantage. We have a sort of competitive edge in these countries where the tariffs have started coming down for us, but they have not done the same for the American company. Now, this is, a, this is sort of a time-limited opportunity. We know the U.S. is interested in entering into free trade agreements with several of the countries, so we may not have this competitive advantage forever. So we usually urge companies, you know, if they're interested in these markets, you know, start looking into it and potentially get in there before the Americans do, and we'll have first mover advantage. We know the U.S. is already in discussion with several of these countries. So the next agreement I'd like to highlight is the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. This is one of our domestic trade agreements. So as you all correctly noted, it includes the federal government, all provinces and territories, and it has a process for reconciling barriers, uh, regulations that can be unnecessary barriers to trade. Another feature of this agreement is that it has enforceable dispute settlement mechanisms. So how this works is that if a jurisdiction isn't living up to our commitments, to the commitments we made, or if they're treating a visa jurisdiction unfairly, we do have a mechanism for resolving that dispute. Another domestic trade agreement we have is the New West Partnership Trade Agreement. This is the NWTP board. It has four provincial provinces in it, uh, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. You may recall it used to be called the Tilma when it was just BC and Alberta. And then we have Saskatchewan joined recently, and then Manitoba joined recently as well. So now it has four provinces in it. There are other provinces that have expressed an interest. You may have seen articles about Ontario expressing an interest in joining this new West Partnership Trade Agreement. So how this agreement differs from the CFTA is that, well, first of all, it builds on what we've agreed across the country, but it's also a more ambitious agreement. So within our regional free trade agreement area, so the four provinces, we actually have better access to each other than the other provinces due to these four provinces. Similar to our other agreements, there are streamlined dispute settlements. So if any of them is not living up to their commitments, we can take them to task. And it also has a, something called streamlined business registration. So if a business wants to register their business here in BC and wants to do business in other provinces, it may do so, it just has to register once, you pay in one province, and you need you just pick a box for the other provinces you want to do business in. So really, like, you know, a very concrete way of making uh, things cheaper, more cost-effective, and just more efficient for companies. So before we go on to the next section, we just want to do a quick poll question to sort of gauge um, sort of the, I guess, the speed of how things are going. So let us know, you know, if we're going at a good pace, too slow, too fast, like we'd like to hear your thoughts and adjust accordingly. Thank you. About right, great. That's great to know. So we will continue as we have been. Thank you for the feedback. So as Ben alluded to earlier in the presentation, we want to talk about the opportunities in common that these trade agreements have for companies and businesses in your community. So we first want to focus on the good sector. So again, anything to, anything you can drop on your toe. We've highlighted three agreements. So the first one is the Korea Agreement. The second one is the European Union Agreement. And the third one is the CPTP 
the one with the Asia Pacific with 11 countries in it. So if you look at the first row, you will see that the overall tariff elimination for these three agreements is quite ambitious. So the Korea agreement, right now, 95% of tariffs on Canadian goods are 0% tariffs. So there are no duties on 95% of Canadian goods. Under, your, under the European Union agreement, 98% of tariffs are now 0%. When this agreement is fully in effect, this will increase to 99%. Under the CPTPP, once it's fully in effect, this will increase to 99% of tariffs becoming 0% as well. So quite a significant competitive advantage. Now, a quick note on this preferential tariff treatment. Companies need to claim these tariff treatments. Like these are not automatically applied at the border. If a company doesn't note that they are able to be eligible under one of these, but they will not have that, that uh, cost saving applied to them. So just remind companies that they need to apply for this. All right. So I pulled out a couple of sectors to give you an example of what the tariff treatment will be for, for companies here in BC. So for example, you'll see agriculture and agri-food under the Korea agreement. Over 97% of Canadian goods, it will be 0% tariff when fully in effect. Uh, if you look at fish and seafood under the CPTPP, so the last column, once fully in effect, 100% of Canadian goods in fish and seafood will have 0% duties once the agreement is fully in effect. So this is quite, quite significant. A couple of other examples, I pulled out what the tariffs are for a technology sector. And one comment on digital products. So if a company has a digital product that is transmitted electronically over the internet, there will be no duties, no tariffs on those products. So continuing on for the goods sector, so Ben mentioned earlier non-tariff barrier reduction and or elimination. So these are things like the duplicate testing, um, duplicate certification, where it may not be needed. Another opportunity is improved rules of origin. So building on what he said, this is a reflection of you know, how the modern economy works. Like it's very rare for one product to be built with 100% components from one country. So if your product has enough domestic content and there are thresholds set in the agreements for different products, your product may still have enough domestic content to be considered Canadian enough that you can send it to the other market and it will be treated as a Canadian product and eligible for a preferential tariff rate. There is increased transparency and predictability for the goods sector, and this is because the rules are spelled out. You know how your product is going to be treated, and you know if it's not treated the way it should be, that you have recourse to it through uh, the dispute settlement. And finally, I just want to make a comment on exceptions. The agreements do try and cover as much as possible of the economy, but governments on both sides that are negotiating, they do sometimes take a small list of exceptions. So, and these are things that they inside will not be covered by the agreement. So it's important for you know, a company to check to see if their product is first of all covered under the agreement and if there is an exception or not. This is also something that we can assist with. So moving on to services. So just to give you an example, you know, if a good, if it was something like a piece of machinery, that would fall under the good sector and the opportunities for the good sector, but if you are supplying a service to service that machinery to repair it or to provide training, then this will fall under the services uh, opportunities of trade agreements. So right off the bat, again, because the rules are spelled out, you know how your service will be treated. You know, for example, that the other country, um, that they can't start doing things, for example, like saying only 30 hairdressers will be allowed in this jurisdiction at any one time, but they can't suddenly bring in a restriction like that. And there are several other commitments that are um, very similar to that, but it's just meant to provide you know, that certainty and that stability and just increase as much market access as possible. So really, if they do make efforts to level the playing field to ensure that you know, your service supplier isn't being treated worse than a service supplier from that domestic market. And again, one comment on exceptions, there are a small list of exceptions, so it's important to see if your service falls under one of these. And finally, I have a table here to show a little bit about how the three agreements that we talked about, the Korea agreement, the EU agreement, and the CPTPP, how they treat services. So the first, the first row is uh, something called positive list versus negative list. And you'll note that all three agreements use something called the negative list. So what this means is that everything is included unless there's a specific exception that's taken against it. So if you read the services chapters, and if you see that there's no exception for your service, that means that it is in. So the, one of the benefits of using a negative list is that it makes it very easy to figure out if something is in or not. Um, under old agreements, people tend to use the positive list, so then you would actually have to see if there's a list of services included, and then you will see if you're in or not. So a uh, negative list is um, 
it's not something that's a lot uh, a lot clearer for businesses. So this is how agreements are tending to go now in uh, in this direction. Another key opportunity for services sectors is the facilitated business entry that was mentioned earlier. So how this works is that for certain categories of professionals, uh, business people, and investors, they are able to have facilitated entry into our FTA partner countries uh, for a temporary amount of time. So this allows, for example, a service supplier to go into another market to provide training around the services selling. Uh, it allows an investor to you know, go in and do some research. It allows them to go service their investment. So really tr understanding that you know, it's not just about sending goods and services over, that there's also like a people element to international trade. So moving on to investment, um, another one thing that uh, these agreements try and do for investment is really provide as much stability and transparency as they can for investors, you know, recognizing that these are very important things when you're making an investment. Uh, and one way they do this is, again, by you know, spelling out the rules, by ensuring there's improved market access. So, for example, in uh, various investment chapters in the agreement, there are different protections and different things called, uh, for example, minimum standard of treatment. So you know how your investment and how you as an investor are going to be treated when you go into the other market. So typically it's like, you know, no worse than the other. There are protections, uh, for example, rules on expropriation and compensation. So again, giving you that stability and knowing how you're going to be treated. And as well, investors can benefit from facilitated business entry, which I mentioned under the previous slide. Similar to the others, there are some exceptions that governments do take. So it is important to see if, um, if the investment that you're trying to make, if it's above a certain threshold or if it's going to be uh, caught in one of these exceptions. And again, something that we can assist with. So the final um, area of economy that we want to cover today is government procurement. So as you know, governments buy things, you know, they buy goods, services, and construction. And what these agreements try and do is give opportunities for a company here in BC to bid on a foreign government contract in another jurisdiction. So Suddenly, you don't just have access to, you know, government procurement here in BC. You have access to government procurement across the country here in Canada, uh, access to government procurement um, in the U.S., in the EU, in Korea, and some of these uh, Asia-specific countries. So really, just trying to broaden what is available to people and just give them more opportunities. So right off the bat, you have improved market access because before, without these agreements, these countries tend to close their government procurement market, so you would be unable to bid on those contracts. Because the rules are spelled out, so much of the other sectors, you have greater certainty and stability, you know how you'll be treated. And very important to keep in mind when you're looking at government procurement is something called coverage and threshold. So with coverage, governments decide what what parts of the which parts of government procurement are going to be covered. So for example, they may decide to only have it at the national level of government, uh, they may include provincial level of government, and they may include local levels of government. Within those levels of coverage, they may also decide that only these 10 ministries or 10 departments are covered. They may decide that tram corporations, for example, are not covered or they are covered. So it is important to figure out for each of the agreements for the market that the company is interested in, whether or not that department or that level of government is covered. Now, the second thing to keep in mind is that there are these things called thresholds. So for a contract to be eligible for a company to bid on, it has to be above a certain threshold. So above that threshold, that contract is available for a foreign company or a company from BC to bid on. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the coverage and thresholds we have here in Canada. So if you look at this, uh, at this table here, this covers five agreements. So the first one is the newest partnership trade agreement. The second one is the CFTA, so the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. The third is the CETA, the European Union Trade Agreement. GPA, that's at the WTO. And finally, the CPTPP. So if you look at each of these agreements, here, these columns here show the coverage. So under the all the agreements, you'll see that ministries and departments at the provincial level are covered. If you go on to Crown Corporations, you'll see that only the first three agreements, the newest partnership and the CFTA, the two domestic agreements, and the European Union agreements, they cover Crown Corporations. You'll see that at the WTO and under the Asia Pacific Agreement, Crown Corps are not covered. Under the MASH sector, so local government, you'll see that only the first three agreements cover local government. So what these numbers mean is that if the contract is worth above these numbers, so 10,000 under the newest, newest partnership trade agreement, um, over 649,000 under the Asia Pacific Agreement, if the contract is worth over those amounts, then a foreign company can bid on it. So these are our thresholds here in BC. 
And then um, the other countries that we've negotiated with, they will have thresholds as well that may be similar to these. So it's important for the company to look and see, first of all, you know, is the level of government they're interested in covered? Uh, what exactly is covered? What ministries, what departments, crown corporations, local government? And then finally, what is the threshold? So just a quick note, these thresholds for three of these agreements, they're adjusted every two years. So the numbers do change every two years. We're uh, working on another update and we'll share that when it's available. Um, the thresholds should be available online as well. So moving on, I'd want to pass it over to Ben, and he's going to show you one of the practical tools that he was mentioning. So this is how to look up tariff rates. I'm just going to switch my screen in one second. All right. Great. Thanks, Chelsea. So uh, before we pass it over to Havind, uh, I just want to quickly walk you through uh, a practical tool uh, called Canada's Tariff Finder. I'll do this very quickly um, so that Havind has some time to uh, speak. And um, this is something that you might consider sharing with uh, uh, any of the businesses that you speak with. Um, it's, um, uh, I'm going to try to do a live demonstration right now. It's very user friendly. It, uh, to begin, all you really need to know is whether you're exporting or importing, uh, the country that you're dealing with, and then the product. So let's um, try a, a, an exporting example. And um, let's uh, input uh, uh, Japan. And you'll, you'll see from the list that, the, that this only includes uh, countries that we have FTAs with. So you, there are ways to find the rates, the tariff rates for countries that we don't have FTAs with. It's just a little bit more uh, difficult. If you, if you can't do that, um, please just let me know and I can certainly help with that. Uh, and, um, and then the next thing you need to know is your product. And there are two ways to do this. You can either just uh, describe the product and the system will try to locate it for you. Uh, or you can put in the harmonized uh, system code with the HS code, and um, we'll try both of, both ways. So let's start by just um, typing in uh, honey. So uh, the the system will then start ask you a series of questions depending on how specific it needs to uh, to get uh, in terms of the different types of honey. And you'll find that if you play around with this, you'll find that each country has very different requirements um, and different subcategories for each product. Um, in this case, it's fairly straightforward. Japan's is just natural honey, so we'll select that and confirm that. <clears throat> and then what it spits out for you here is uh, it shows you what Japan's rate normally is. That MFN rate uh, is most favored nation rate. That's the rate that they've set through the WTO I talked about earlier on. 25 and a half percent. So if you don't have a free trade agreement with Japan and you are um, exporting honey into that market, that is the rate that will be applied on that honey. Now, what the system then shows you is any preferential rates that Canada has. And so here you see that because Japan is a member of the CPTPP, under that agreement, Japan has agreed to uh, phase out its its tariff rates on honey. And so this year it's 22.3%. It's slightly better than the 25.5% that everyone else will pay. And over, over the years, um, that is going to be gradually phased out to zero by 2026. So that's, um, you know, that's, that's a good example of a, of a product that, um, you know, we're, we're going to see some good benefits from uh, through these agreements. Um, the system, uh, of course, can can do other things as well, and so let's let's just go back and try a different product, and see if we can do a comparison. And so this time we're going to uh, we're going to look up cherries, but we're going to we're going to look it up by uh, HS code, and uh, the code for that is 0809.29. And so um, we may need a let's see what happens. Okay, there we go. So this is uh, the code for cherries. And um, we're going to uh, actually, we're going to go back first. Sorry, all of that. Uh, just X at the top. At the, uh, so we're going to go back and, and first we're going to select uh, Vietnam. That's because I think Vietnam and Japan categories are a little different. Oh, maybe not. Okay, so, so then we're going to select uh, Cherries there, as you did with honey. And this is showing to Vietnam. And so, think on cherries. 
This year that, that rate is the same, but next year it's going to zero. So they've agreed to reduce those to zero almost immediately. Uh, now we're going to go up to, we're going to scroll up a little bit to underneath the uh, code at the top, and we're going to say add to compare. Just a little right there, yeah. And then we're going to uh, click on the compared uh, icon to the right side of the screen. And, and then it should ask us should ask us if we want to add more to the compare. So we're going to add there. Now we're going to, this is, now we can just change the country if we want to keep the same code. We can go back to Japan, for example, and see how that looks. And find that and do the same thing. And it will spit us out the same thing. Um, you see the similar phase out. Now we're going to add that to compare as well at the top left. And then we're going to do one more, but this time we're going to get out of the CPTPP. We're going to add another one to compare. Um, we're going to try Korea. Uh, probably under South Korea. There we go. So you can see that it indicates beside the country name the agreement that's the relevant agreement. And um, we're going to add that to compare as well. And then we're going to take a look at our comparison. So if, if uh, just click the compare at the top. Yeah. So if, if you are um, considering various markets uh, and you may be making a decision on whether they should enter a particular market, um, this this might the visual may help with just sort of seeing how that phase out process looks and maybe it does maybe it doesn't make sense for for uh, exporting at you know at the moment and maybe they they want to plan for a few years down the road where when when the tariffs are are a little better. So that is um, just a very basic high-level uh, uh, walkthrough of Canada's tariff finder. There are a few other functions, but um, if you're interested, please just uh, play around with it, and, uh, and uh, hopefully it's uh, useful. Now I'm going to pass things over to Heather. So great. Thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, so Ben and Chelsea have done a great job now of uh, creating a huge demand for, your, uh, for you guys, and now they're knocking on your door going, well, now what do we do? We know we can enter these markets, but we don't know uh, how to do it as a company, and we don't know how to do it uh, as an organization in the area. So we have a trade readiness and services branch as part of uh, the ministry, and our job is to help promote international trade uh, through the region. We have uh, service sector experts as well as several programs. I'm going to highlight uh, today the program side of things, but we do have experts in areas such as fintech, international education, agriculture, clean tech, uh, and ICT, for instance. So they're happy to answer questions or travel out to meet with your companies at any time. So some of the key programs we have are uh, we the, the Canadian Agriculture Partnership Program, uh, the Export Navigator Program, the Trade Accelerator Program, and of course, uh, if you've not heard of it, our extensive trade investment network uh, around the country. I'm going to focus a little bit on each of these programs and give you some very high-level uh, information so it, it gives you a little bit of takeaway. So the next slide, we'll, we're talking about the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program. What is it? Well, we deliver this in partnership uh, with the BC Ministry of Agriculture and the federal uh, agency, equivalent agency. Uh, the focus on our side is to help promote international trade on, for companies around the world. And we do that two ways. We have the input, uh, in, uh, inbound trade that, programs and we have the outbound trade programs. For the domestic side of things, what we try and do is we bring international buyers to the province. So they're actually dealing directly with your companies and they're ready to make purchases. So they're not kicking tires, they're not checking things out, they're here to actually buy things. For instance, the, the, the Comox Seafood Festival, we had almost 70 buyers from around the world attending a meeting with companies looking to purchase. We have a, a new uh, trade mission coming in in the next, uh, I think, next month or so, traveling to three cities, Vancouver and Kelowna and uh, Bailon, I believe. Uh, they'll, they'll have 10 buyers with them, and they're meeting with 70 companies. And, and the key is for these trade missions or these meetings are that they want to meet directly with the decision makers. So we're not looking for somebody who's taking information back. They want to meet with the companies or the agents who can actually negotiate the deal right then and there. Our outbound missions on the other side is the international side. So we are actively sort of trying to showcase our companies and their expertise around the world. So we 
organized trade missions that are typically paid for in some respects, or if not paid for, we help subsidize in terms of making sure that there are activities, meetings, uh, events that are key for potential business uh, dealings going on. And you can see an extensive list there. We don't live in ourselves, so the US, Europe, and Asia are covered off by these various agreements. And these are, this is a typically a three-year agreement that we negotiate with the federal government, so you do know we have some sort of stability that if a company goes one year, there is a potential to go the next year. The next program I want to talk about, and hopefully many of you have heard, is the Export Navigator Program. This is a key sort of a, a program for the ministry, and it is delivered in the region. It's a free service. We have six export navigators located uh, in various cities, but they do cover off the various regions. So there's one in Duncan, Port Alberni, Prince Rupert, uh, Prince George, Dawson Creek has a half-time advisor right now, uh, Vernon and Nelson. They are designed to be one-stop shops. Uh, they work with companies who are thinking about exporting to companies who are already exporting. We don't, uh, you know, we don't try and differentiate uh, in terms of expertise or level of expertise. We want them to start thinking about exporting as quickly as possible, and we want to help them think about the hurdles, such as free trade agreements, what uh, markets to go into, are they already exporting into the U.S.? Can we expand that or grow them somewhere else? It, it is what I call a cradle to grave type service. You can access it at any time. You can continue to access. Uh, but the key is that we're trying to make sure that we get companies to think diversification and new markets. Uh, one of the new features of this program, it, uh, it has just recently been announced as a full-time program by the minister, but we also have an agreement with Western Diversification where we have three full-time advisors focusing on three key priority areas. And these areas are indigenous, women and youth. For our purposes, youth is uh, defined as uh, less than 29 uh, for, this, for this program. And the federal government and the provincial governments have different uh, levels of criteria, but we've agreed to an uh, under 29 being, uh, being the uh, criteria for this program. Those three uh, people have provincial-wide uh, service. So they're located, one, uh, the indigenous is located in Kamloops, and uh, women and youth advisor are located in Vancouver. However, they are uh, targeting the whole province and help supplement their expert navigators' expertise. So, you know, this is, this is a, again, I, I encourage everybody to try and take advantage of this program or refer companies to them. They help with their business planning. They help with their export planning. They help with their sort of local referrals to federal programs uh, that are on a timely basis. So they're accessing programs when they need to be accessing them. The next program we have is TAP. And this is a tech trade accelerator program that is mainly, I would call, lower mainland Victoria focused. It is a more extensive program. It's for companies that typically are already exporting and are really now in the process of fine tuning or really going hard into a new market. It is covered over six weeks. There's a two day workshop, uh, a single one day export plan with experts brought in, and then finally a mentorship program. And the idea of the mentorship program is to provide feedback on their plans and give them advice on the next steps. This is typically it's delivered through the world uh, Trade Center Vancouver, and they, they if, if fully financed, it'd be about a $2,500 to $5,000 uh, uh, workshop. However, it's, if it's referred to by either yourselves or some of the ministry or an expert navigator, it, it is free. Uh, as I said, it is typically a lower mainland focus, but they are delivering a workshop in Prince George in November, for instance, and they do happen to go into Kelowna and count the odd time. The idea was that they did not want to duplicate the expert navigator services, so they're a little selective in where they go. Uh, however, uh, companies in the region, if they're going to Vancouver, could absolutely access the program as well. As I say, it's simply a referral, and it's, it's, a free, it's a free seminar. Very useful, really gets them ready to go and gets them ready to export uh, almost immediately. The final sort of slide I want to talk about, and if you aren't aware of it, is our trade and investment uh, network around the world. Uh, very unique it, 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 in terms of a, it is strictly BC focused. Uh, there is a Global Affairs Canada who have a far more extensive network. So if we don't have a, a, a representative, say in South America, there uh, we would we would work with Global Affairs Canada. However, if we do have an office, uh, they are there to work strictly for our BC companies. Uh, so there may be 50 companies going on a trade show, but if there's 10 BC companies, we contact our trade and investment representative. Uh, let's say in Jakarta. That representative will set up a trade mission for them. They'll set up meetings. They'll try and organize high-level introductions that will help facilitate uh, businesses. 
Uh, an example, for instance, is we just had a company go to the FinTech uh, Festival in Singapore last year. We managed to get them to speak uh, at a pitch, uh, which wasn't something that typically was open to Canadian companies. They ended up winning it, $100,000 in Singapore money, and now, a year later, have signed a major deal with a Singapore bank to provide their services. So an extremely good way to an opportunity for our companies to showcase themselves around the world. And I said, this is also a free service. Uh, these representatives are on the ground, local experts who are ready uh, to do, do the work for the company there. But you also do bring them in to BC as well. So we do have an opportunity to meet them while they're traveling the province. Uh, for instance, there was an educational, international educational conference in Whistler where they met with another company. We do bring managing directors in and they will do uh, a regional tour uh, trying to meet as many companies and talk about local investments and trade opportunities as possible. So the intent for these is really to sort of highlight and showcase our BC companies uh, on an international stage and act as somewhat as their business representatives and make sure that they get value for those trips. Uh, if, if do you do know companies are going to trade shows, please let us know. Uh, we can help uh, either organize those meetings or we can help refer them to some subsidy programs like the uh, CAN export program the federal government delivers to help uh, offset some of their costs. So. Uh, our contact information is on the next slide or at the ending slide, but please feel free to reach out any time, uh, and we're here to help. So thank you, and uh, if there are any questions, we can take those, I guess. Um, thanks, Ben. Before we do, I'll just quickly uh, run through this, uh, these resources. So we, we talked about Canada Tariff Finder. Uh, the Report of Trade Barrier site there is somewhere where the uh, businesses can go to let uh, the federal government know about anything that they're encountering in, in, in their market. Uh, BC Export Navigator, that's been talked about. Uh, we've got the Canada FDA Guide for Municipalities there as well. And then the contact information, our emails uh, for all three of us, and uh, BC Trade and Investment Representatives website. And trade, Canada's Trade Commissioner Service, which is sort of the federal uh, equivalent of uh, that CIR uh, network. And so all of that is there, and I guess I'll turn it back over to Jessica. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'll just leave that information up there in case you want to jot down any of the names of the presenters to get in touch with them with any further information. Uh, we haven't had any other questions come in, but if you want to take a, we have a couple minutes now, you can always pop your questions in and our panelists can answer the questions offline and respond to you in email if they don't have time now. Um, but it doesn't look like we have any else, any more coming in. So I would just like to say thank you again to the presenters that, and for making the time to share this really valuable information with our audience. And if you do want to share this information, it will be posted, like I said, on our website, um, economic on the Economic Development site under BC Ideas Exchange. And um, if you are not already subscribed to our webinar series, I'd encourage you to do that. We have a lot of topical and interesting web webinar topics coming up for the rest of the month, um, including what local governments can expect with the new ride hailing framework, um, what uh, local governments, how they can benefit with the local government legislation, and um, some interesting topics um, planned for November. If anyone has any suggestions or any information that they would like to hear on a webinar topic, they can email us um, at economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca. And I'll just pop up. Uh, pop up our email there. So if anyone would like to um, send us an email, that would be great. After the webinar today, please do um, fill out the survey that will be sent to you in about an hour. It does help us improve our webinars and um, for the next time and make sure that we're taking your feedback and incorporating them to uh, make sure that each experience is better. So thank you, everyone. If I haven't seen any more questions come in, so I'm going to sign off and close the webinar. And thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.